Getting to Know and Love Prophet Muhammad, Peace Be Upon Him Prophet Muhammad's Biography From Birth to Death By the Sincere Seeker Kids Collection Narrated by Brad Grahowski God sends messengers and prophets to us, and we learn about Prophet Muhammad. Due to God's love and mercy, He sent many messengers and prophets to us to teach us about Himself and His religion. God's messengers and prophets taught us our life purpose and showed us the way to God. They all taught the same general message, that no one should be worshipped except Allah, the Creator of the heavens and earth, the Creator of the universe, the Creator of you and me. The messengers and prophets of God taught their people that Allah is the one and only God, without any partner, son, daughter, or equal. All other gods are false and are only the creations of God and not the actual Creator Himself. The messengers and prophets' message came with good news and a warning. The good news is for those who believe in God, obey Him, and live a good, righteous life, letting them know that their past sins will be forgiven and a generous reward of paradise will be awarded to them in the afterlife in which they will live forever. The warning is for those who disbelieve in God and live a life of disobedience, letting them know that if they continue their evil ways, they will live a bad life in this world and the afterlife. Studying the life of Prophet Muhammad is important for many reasons. Studying the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a responsibility given to us by our Creator. It is a form of worship, and we get rewarded for it. Studying the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the best way to develop and increase our love for him. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the perfect role model for us, who showed and taught us the best way to live life and the best character one could have. We learn about him so we can follow and copy him to be better human beings and get us closer to Allah. Studying the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, helps us better understand the Holy Quran and its context. Studying Sirah, the life of our final prophet, also raises our hopes and gives us optimism. The Land of Makkah Filled with Idols and Idol Worship Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born in Mecca in the year of the elephant. Mecca is the home of the Kaaba, the first house of worship built on earth by Prophet Abraham and his son Ismail, peace be upon them. Before Prophet Muhammad became a prophet, many people of Mecca worshipped idols and believed that idols had the power to intercede for them. It was a time full of ignorance, foolishness, and misguidance. At the time, Arabia was a backward nation that did not have monuments, a unified government, or law and order. They also did not have written literature, and many did not know how to read and write. Sadly, they had turned the Kaaba, which was dedicated and built for the service of the one true God, Allah, the Glorious, into a place of worship and idols. Angel Gabriel splits open Prophet Muhammad's chest and washes his heart. Prophet Muhammad's father died before Prophet Muhammad was born, and he was raised by his mother. At the time, it was a custom for Arabs living in towns to send their young boys to the desert to live with a wet nurse in a Bedouin tribe for a few years so they could grow stronger and healthier in the harsh climate and for other reasons. No one originally wanted to take Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a child because he was an orphan, and they wouldn't have gotten much money for him. Then Prophet Muhammad's mother, Amina, eventually sent her child to live with a poor lady named Halima and her husband to spend a couple of years or so in the desert. As soon as they brought on Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a child, they began to see miracles around them. Their old goat that stopped producing milk a while back started to produce milk again, and their camel, which was weak and slow, gained strength and speed. While Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was out playing with his foster brothers, Angel Gabriel came down in a human form. 
The other kids saw him and ran screaming in terror to Halima and her husband, thinking Prophet Muhammad was being abducted. Angel Gabriel forced him to the ground as Prophet Muhammad struggled to get loose, but Angel Gabriel overpowered him. Angel Gabriel pulled out a golden utensil with a golden tray filled with zamzam water and began to split open his chest and take out his heart to wash it. Angel Gabriel took out a black blood clot and threw it away, saying, This is Shaitan's devil portion. He then stitched him back up. Halima and her husband rushed over to Prophet Muhammad, whose face was pale from fear. Halima's husband comforted him with a hug and took him in to rest. They realized that there was something special with this boy, and decided it was best to return him to his mother, Amina, in Mecca. He lived with her for a short period, and then sadly she passed away from illness on her way back from the city of Yathrib, later to be called Medina. His loving grandfather, Abdul Mutalib, ended up raising him for two years. He loved Prophet Muhammad more than he loved his own children. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would watch and learn from his grandfather what it would be like to be the leader of the Arabs, as his grandfather was the senior statesman of their tribe. At the age of eight, Prophet Muhammad's grandfather passes away, and the charge of Prophet Muhammad was passed down to his uncle Abu Talib, who was the brother of Prophet Muhammad's father. His uncle also loved and preferred him over his children. Being an orphan taught Prophet Muhammad wisdom and helped mature him quickly, and he learned to be independent, which helped prepare him to bear the tough life and battles he would later go through. Prophet Muhammad's Marriage to His Wife, Khadijah, Peace Be Upon Her As a young man, Prophet Muhammad worked as a shepherd for the people of Mecca, bringing him a small wage just like past prophets who were shepherds in their time. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not grow up as many others did, drinking alcohol and consuming other harmful things for the soul or body, nor did he ever worship idols. He grew up establishing a reputation for himself as an honest and trustworthy person. In his early twenties, due to his maturity and character, he was invited to participate in the tribe's state meetings with the leaders of the tribe. Khadijah, peace be upon her, was the wealthiest businesswoman on Makkah, who inherited a lot of money from her husband who passed away. She was known for her pureness, nobility, wisdom, and fortune. Her sister had a herd of camels and hired Prophet Muhammad, and Khadijah heard her sister praise Prophet Muhammad for his nobility, integrity, kindness, good manners, shyness, and other good qualities. Since Khadijah, peace be upon her, was a lady, she was not able to participate in transactions and trades in person, and instead invested in business partnerships that would go to Syria and Yemen by sending men to go on her behalf and pay them a fraction of the profits. However, she would often find herself receiving fewer profits than she should have, because the men that she hired would pocket some of the profits. She decided to employ Prophet Muhammad to take her merchandise to Syria, even though he was inexperienced. Before he accepted the job, he asked his uncle for permission, who said yes. When Prophet Muhammad returned to Makkah, she noticed triple the profits and blessings than she used to get. She was very impressed with his character and dealings. He was known to his community as the truthful, the trustworthy, and was trusted by everyone in his community, even by those who did not like him. Khadijah, peace be upon her, was twice widowed, and many men from her tribe had proposed marriage to her, yet she did not accept any proposals, nor was she thinking about getting remarried. Khadijah's older friend approached Prophet Muhammad and hinted that Khadijah was interested in marrying him. Khadijah was older than Prophet Muhammad, and Prophet Muhammad was around twenty-five years old. Prophet Muhammad was interested in marrying Khadijah, so he asked permission from his uncle, who thought it was a good idea because of the type of person Khadijah was. They had a beautiful marriage, full of love and understanding. Khadijah supported Prophet Muhammad through his tough years. They had six children together, three sons and three daughters. All the males died in childhood. Rebuilding of the Kaaba After the Flood 
At the age of 35, a flood destroyed the Kaaba, and it needed to be rebuilt. Each tribe in Mecca was responsible for rebuilding a part of the Kaaba. The black stone, a holy sacred object that was sent down from paradise within the Kaaba, was removed for the renovation and needed to be placed back into the Kaaba. The leaders of Mecca were in disagreement for five days, and blood was almost shed trying to determine which clan would have the honor of placing the black stone back in its original place. They concluded that the next man that walked in would choose who would place the black stone to its original place. That person turned out to be Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Instead of choosing a particular person or clan to place the black stone back in its original place, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, asked for a cloth in which he placed the black stone in the center, and had the leader of each clan hold a corner of the cloth and carry it back to the Kaaba together. Then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, set the black stone with his two hands in its original place, and all the clans were satisfied. This demonstrated and symbolized the future of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and how he would soon unify the Arab tribes under one banner of Islam, and unify the religion of Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, after it was destroyed. Angel Gabriel comes down to Prophet Muhammad to reveal the first verses of the Quran. As Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would walk, he would hear rocks and stones greet him. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would also see pleasant dreams, which would prove to become true when he awoke. Prophet Muhammad had the habit of sitting by himself in a cave called Hira because he felt something was missing in his life and he didn't know what it was. Even though he had a good wife and children, a good life, and good status in society, he felt something was missing. He knew having these alone does not bring happiness. He would go to Cave Hira to think about life, this universe, and this world. He would meditate, ponder, reflect deeply, and wonder how to worship Allah. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was forty years old during the month of Ramadan, Angel Gabriel startled Prophet Muhammad in the cave and demanded that he read, even though he did not know how to read or write. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, replied, I do not know how to read. Then Angel Gabriel squeezed Prophet Muhammad so tight it caused him to lose all his energy. Angel Gabriel repeated the request two more times in which Prophet Muhammad had the same response. Angel Gabriel grasped Prophet Muhammad with overwhelming force, then released him again. Then the first recitation of the Holy Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad via Angel Gabriel. Recite in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clinging substance. Recite and your Lord is the most generous, who taught by the pen, taught man that which he knew not. Quran chapter 96, Ayahs 1 through 5. It was the beginning of Allah the Glorious' first revelation, sent via Angel Gabriel to humanity, meant until the end of times. Prophet Muhammad hurried home to his supportive wife in fear and asked her to cover him. She quickly covered him with a cloak. When Prophet Muhammad calmed a bit, he told her what had happened and that he was scared. She replied, comforting her husband with the following statement, God will never humiliate you, as you are good to your family. You take on other people's burdens and help the needy. Prophet Muhammad continued to receive revelations for the remainder of his life. These revelations were memorized and written down by the Prophet's companions, and were later compiled to make up the Holy Quran, which we have today. Prophet Muhammad spreads and preaches Islam privately, then publicly. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was walking and heard a sound. So he looked up in the heavens and saw Angel Gabriel sitting on a throne in the heavens and earth. Prophet Muhammad was terrified again and hurried home to his wife and asked her to cover him. Then Angel Gabriel revealed the second revelation of the Holy Quran. O oh, you who covers himself with a garment! Arise and warn, and your Lord glorify, and your clothing purify, and uncleanliness avoid. 
and do not confer favor to acquire more, but for your Lord be patient. Quran chapter 74, Ayahs 1 through 7. For the first three years, Prophet Muhammad started to spread the message of Islam privately, one on one, to his close family and friends that he thought would be interested in Islam, freeing them from the practices of their forefathers and the worship of false idols, and did not publicize the message yet. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught and preached that there is only one true God that deserves to be worshipped and praised, and all other gods, including idols, are false and are only creations of God, not the actual Creator Himself. The first person to accept the message of Islam was his wife Khadijah, as well as her cousin Waraka. The first slave to convert was Zaid. The first child to convert was his cousin Ali bin Abi Talib and the first free adult to convert was his best friend Abu Bakr al-Sadiq. Peace be upon them all. After three years of secretly struggling to spread Islam to his close companions, Prophet Muhammad converted thirty people. Then, God instructed Prophet Muhammad to publicize and spread the message of Islam to the public and to speak out against idolatry and the worship of false gods to the people of Mecca then later to spread the message beyond Mecca. Khadijah, peace be upon her, supported the rise of Islam with her wealth by providing food, water, and medicine for the Muslims. The Idol Worshippers of Mecca Persecute and Harass the Believers Prophet Muhammad and his early followers, peace be upon them, were being mistreated, bullied, and harassed by the idol worshippers of their tribe, the Quraishi tribe in Mecca. The idol worshippers would shame them, mock at them, and ridicule them. They would call Prophet Muhammad a madman, a liar, a sorcerer, a magician, and one that is possessed by a jinn. They would prevent Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims from praying at Allah's sacred house, the Kaaba, and they would cover them in dirt and filth when praying. Despite all the ridicule, Prophet Muhammad continued to preach and teach the message of Islam to the Arabs of Mecca in a gentle manner. He warned them that if they continued to worship other gods besides Allah and not follow the path of Allah, they would face a serious punishment like the previous nations did, who also disobeyed Allah and his messengers. The idol worshippers of Mecca told Prophet Muhammad, if you are really a prophet of God, why don't you split the moon in half, proving you are a prophet? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, responded, If I do this with the will of God, will you then believe I am the prophet? They answered, Yes. Prophet Muhammad then pointed to the moon, and in front of their eyes the moon split in half. However, Mecca's idol worshippers arrogantly turned around, saying that he'd blinded them to the truth and had bewitched their eyes. The people of Quraysh plotted to stop the Muslims from growing because they were worried that their power and prestige were at risk, so they made plans to try to stop them. They tortured their family members that accepted Islam as the religion and way of life. When the harassment by their own people of Quraysh grew more severe and unbearable, some of the Muslims decided to travel to Abyssinia, Ethiopia to seek shelter and protection from the kingdom of the Christian king of Abyssinia, who was a fair and righteous king that would welcome the Muslims. This was known as the first Hijrah, migration of the Muslims. Later, more Muslims who were being harassed would join them. The Idol Worshippers of Mecca Prostrate to Allah In Ramadan, Prophet Muhammad recited Surah An-Najm, the chapter of the star, from the Holy Quran to a gathering that included some of the high-ranked idol worshippers from the tribe of Quraysh in Mecca. The powerful words of Allah impacted the listeners' hearts, and the unbelievers were overwhelmed in emotion and could not help themselves but unconsciously bowed down in prostration. The idol worshippers that were not present got upset when they heard what happened. The idol worshippers that prostrated made up lies about what happened to justify why they prostrated. News of this incident was highly exaggerated and misreported to the Muslims who migrated to Abyssinia, which led them to think that the idol worshippers of Mecca had accepted Islam, so they made their way back to Mecca. As the Muslims got close to Mecca, they found out that the rumor was not true. 
When they arrived at Mecca, some of the Muslims traveled back to Abyssinia. With the Muslims growing and some big names converted to Islam, this scared the idol worshippers of Mecca. After many attempts to stop Prophet Muhammad and the believers from spreading Islam, they went back to their old ways of bullying and torturing the Muslims in a more severe way than they did the first time. The idol worshippers of Mecca held a meeting and decided not to involve any of the Muslims in any intermarriage or have any business dealings with any of them. The Year of the Sorrow In the following year, back-to-back-to-back -back -back calamities hit Prophet Muhammad within two months. Prophet Muhammad's beloved uncle Abu Talib, who had been protecting him against his enemies, felt sick and died without accepting Islam. About forty days after that, the Prophet's wife Khadijah, peace be upon her, who was a huge support for him, died as well. It was known as the Year of Sorrow, a very tough and sad year for the Prophet, peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad was not seen smiling for months. Later, Prophet Muhammad and his adopted son Zaid traveled to a town called Taif to spread the message of Islam and to find protection and support from another city only to receive disrespect and refusal. They also pelted them with stones, leaving them bloody, and then asked them to return to Mecca. It was Prophet Muhammad's most difficult day of his life. Prophet Muhammad needed to migrate to another city for protection. He was secretly reaching out to different tribes on the outskirts of Mecca to spread the message of Allah and to find a tribe that would welcome him in their land and support him. Prophet Muhammad approached five people from the city of Yathrib, later to be called Medina, and conveyed the message of God to them. They went back to their city and spread the news among their people that a prophet had arisen among the Arabs, who was to call them to God and put an end to the worship of their false gods. Later, Prophet Muhammad concluded a marriage contract with Aisha, peace be upon her. Prophet Muhammad's Night Journey and Ascension In the twelfth year of Prophet Muhammad's mission, Angel Gabriel came down to Prophet Muhammad and opened his chest up once again to remove his heart and wash it, to strengthen him to what he was about to see and experience, known as the Night Journey and Ascension. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, took a night journey from Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem on a speedy beast which was pure white, called El Burak, in the company of the archangel Gabriel. When they reached their destination, they tied the beast to a ring in the gate of the mosque. Prophet Muhammad prayed two units of prayer and turned around and found all the prophets behind him. He led the prophets in prayer. After visiting Masjid al-Aqsa, they ascended physically to the heavens. Angel Gabriel set out with Prophet Muhammad on the same horse till they reached the first heaven. When the gate opened, Prophet Muhammad saw Prophet Adam there in the first heaven. Angel Gabriel introduced Prophet Adam to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them both. Then Angel Gabriel and Prophet Muhammad ascended to the second heaven, then the third, and then the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh heaven, where they saw and greeted other prophets of God including Prophet John and Jesus, Joseph, Enoch and Aaron, Moses and Abraham. Peace be upon them all. Then Prophet Muhammad was carried to the remotest lot tree, where its fruits are like jugs, and its leaves are as big as elephant ears. He was also shown the much-frequented house, which is located above the Kaaba in the seventh heaven, which has a group of seventy thousand angels circling it, leave and never to return being followed by the next group of seventy thousand angels, and will continue like this until the day of judgment. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was then presented to the divine presence of Allah, the Glorious, where Allah issued the five daily prayers to us. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, returned, some of the people believed in his story, as they were well aware of the power and ability of God. And some did not believe him and mocked him, including one of the biggest enemies of Islam, Abu Jahl. Muslims migrate to the city of Medina. Later, the people of Yathrib, who spoke to Prophet Muhammad the year prior, 
had converted to Islam and returned to Prophet Muhammad, promising to support him, and invited him to their city, which Prophet Muhammad agreed to. Now that the Muslims had a place to live without persecution, many of the Muslims migrated to Yathrib, which was later named Medina. About 100 families quietly migrated from Mecca to Medina secretly. Many of the Muslim immigrants that traveled to Abyssinia prior also migrated to Medina. The Prophet, his cousin Ali, and his friend Abu Bakr remained in Mecca for the time being. The Prophet was waiting for instructions from God before migrating. The idol worshippers of Mecca feared the growth and power of the Muslims. They saw them as a threat to their religion and began to think of ways to kill Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even though that would go against their laws, as it was unheard of to kill someone of their own blood, especially in the sacred land for Mecca. Each tribe sent one of their young men to the Prophet's house to kill him. Then Angel Gabriel was sent down to Prophet Muhammad to let him know what the idol worshippers of Mecca were plotting. Angel Gabriel also informed Prophet Muhammad that he has Allah's permission to leave Mecca. The enemies of the Prophet surrounded his house, but Allah covered their eyes and blinded them, allowing Prophet Muhammad to escape while reciting verses from chapter Yasin from the Holy Quran. Prophet Muhammad and his cousin Abu Bakr fled to a cave named Thor, where they spent three days. Upon arrival in Medina, Prophet Muhammad's first task was to build a mosque called Masjid Kuba in the very site where his camel knelt down. Prophet Muhammad helped his companions build this mosque by carrying bricks and stones while reciting verses of the Holy Quran. With God and the Quran's guidance, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught and preached the Islamic way of life to his companions in Medina. He was their guide, teacher, judge, counselor, arbitrator, advisor, and father figure to the new community in Medina. The migration of the Muslims to Medina is known as the Hijrah in Arabic and was later chosen to be the start of the Muslim calendar. Those who emigrated from Mecca to Medina earned the title of Muhajirin, the emigrants. The Muslims that were living in Medina and welcomed and supported the emigrants adopted the title of the Ansar, the helpers. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made a pact of mutual religious solidarity between both Muslim groups. Prophet Muhammad entered into treaties with other tribes living around them, and they would all support one another in defending the city against an attack. For the first time, the Muslims had their own state. After about a year and a half after the Muslims migrated to Medina, the Qibla, the direction in which Muslims pray, was changed after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made a dua, prayer supplication, to Allah the Glorious to change the direction from Masjid al-Aqsa to the Kaaba. The Battle of Badr Supported with Angels Towards the second year of the Muslims migrating to Medina, the idol worshippers of Mecca began a series of harsh acts against the Muslims living in Medina. They sent men to destroy the Muslims' fruit trees and carry away their flocks. Soon, permission was given by God to Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims to fight back to protect themselves and their families because they had been wronged by the oppressive idol worshippers, who kicked them out of their homes in Mecca and denied them their basic freedoms and rights. Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims prepared their state of military. A force of 1,300 men of Mecca's idol worshippers marched under their leader, Abu Jal, the great enemy of Islam, towards Medina and the Muslims to attack them. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had sent scouts and learned their enemies were on their way to kill them. About 313 of the Muslims gathered in the plains of Badr, located near the sea between Mecca and Medina, with only 70 camels and three horses. They had their men ride in turns, since they did not have enough camels. This battle is known as the Battle of Badr because it occurred in the Valley of Badr. The two armies met in the month of Ramadan. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, spent the whole night in prayer and supplication to God, the most merciful, that his small Muslim army would not be destroyed. As the two armies met in the valley of Badr, 
Allah the Glorious supported the Muslims with 1,000 angels that came down to fight alongside them. With the help of the angels that God sent down, the Muslims were able to defeat the idol worshippers. The battle ended with the idol worshippers of Mecca fleeing back to Mecca with a great loss. Several of their chiefs and leaders were killed, including Abu Jahl. Seventy of the idol worshippers of Mecca were killed, while only fifteen Muslims died as martyrs. The idol worshippers also had seventy of their people taken as prisoners of war, who remained in the hands of the Muslims. The Battle of Uhud Muslims archers leave their post. The Battle of Badra left Mecca's idol worshippers grieving from their loss, and they wanted to seek revenge against the Muslims. Later, another battle occurred between the idol worshippers of Mecca and the Muslims, called the Battle of Uhud, a hill four miles to the north of the city of Medina. The idol worshippers made better preparations this time to attack and beat the Muslims. The idol worshippers gathered an army of 3,000 men, 200 horses, and even two dozen of their women under their current leader, Abu Sufyan. The Muslims were less in number at around 1,000 men and only one horse. Later, the Muslims were abandoned by 300 of the hypocrites of the Muslims, so the number of Muslims went down to 700 men instead of 1,000. Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims offered their prayers in the morning, then advanced to the plains to prepare for battle. When they reached the place of battle, Prophet Muhammad positioned some of his men to have their backs toward the hill. Prophet Muhammad then placed fifty Muslim archers on top of the hill behind the Muslim troops to prevent the idol worshippers from surrounding the Muslims, and so they could have a good view from afar. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, commanded the Muslim archers on top of the hill not to leave their post no matter what happens, even if they see the idol worshippers fleeing, and he was very strict and clear about that. Later, the Muslims were winning the battle, and it appeared the Muslims had defeated the idol worshippers. The Muslim archers on top of the hill saw the idol worshippers fleeing the battlefield and had left some of their stuff behind. The Muslim archers on top of the hill began to dispute among themselves if they should go down and grab what the idol worshippers had left behind. The leader of the Muslim archers that Prophet Muhammad appointed asked them, Have you forgotten what Prophet Muhammad told us? Fifty Muslim archers that were instructed not to leave their post left their position, except for ten of them. This allowed the idol worshippers of Mecca to come back around, climb the hill, attack the Muslims, surround and surprise them from the back, and create complete disorder which resulted in the Muslims losing. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, called his companions back, but only twelve men remained with the Prophet. Prophet Muhammad was struck down by stones, wounded in the face by two arrows, and fell unconscious. About seventy or seventy-five of the Muslims were killed in this battle, and among them was the Prophet's uncle Hamza, peace be upon them all. Of the idol worshippers, twenty-two men died. The Betrayal of the Jewish Tribes of Medina After the Muslims lost the Battle of Uhud, the Muslims were treated differently by the Jewish and Arab tribes in Mecca. The Jewish tribe of Banu Kenuka increased their hostility against the Muslims. They told Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he came to remind them of their treaty not to be deceived over their victory in the Battle of Badra against the idol worshippers of Quraysh since they had little understanding of the art of war. They also added if the Muslims had fought them, they would see how war really was and how fierce of an enemy they were. They also broke the treaty with the Muslims by killing a Muslim in the marketplace. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ended the treaty with them and expelled them from the city by giving them three days to pack their stuff and leave. Another Jewish tribe in Medina called Bani Nadir also broke their treaty with the Muslims by attempting to kill Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by asking him to sit in a particular place where they tried to drop a big piece of wall of a fortress. But Angel Gabriel told Prophet Muhammad what they were plotting, and he got up.
Prophet Muhammad had no other choice but to expel this Jewish tribe from Medina as well for their evil actions and betrayal. Prophet Muhammad asked them to grab all their belongings and leave the city, which they did and moved to a neighboring city called Kaibar. The Battle of the Trench Soon, the Jewish tribe of Bani Nadir that were expelled from their homes because of what they had done to the Muslims wanted to get the land back they'd lost and wanted to wipe out the Muslims. They started to recruit and negotiate alliances with other tribes, including the idol worshippers in Mecca. They also negotiated with the hypocrites of the Muslims who helped them attack the Muslims. In the fifth year of the Muslims migrating to Medina, Abu Sufyan, the leader of the non-believers, set out with 10,000 men from different tribes. This was the greatest army ever seen in the Arabian Peninsula at the time. The Muslims had only about 2,500 to 3,000 men, so they were greatly outnumbered once again. This battle was called the Battle of Al-Hazab, the Battle of the Confederates or Groups. The Muslims needed a plan to defend themselves against the enemies of Islam. One of the companions, Salman the Persian, peace be upon him, suggested digging a deep ditch around the city, making it difficult for the enemies to cross over quickly. They did not need to dig through the entire city, since part of the city of Medina was covered with volcanic rock formations, mountains, houses tightly congested together, and large plantations of date trees, making it impossible for large armies to get through. Digging a trench was a technique used by the Persians, and it was unheard of to the Arabs. All the Muslims, including Prophet Muhammad and children, worked together to dig the trenches using only a shovel each. The trench was about 13 feet wide and 2 kilometers long and took somewhere around 1 to 2 weeks to dig. Once the trench had been dug, they waited for the enemies to come. When they arrived, the enemies of Islam saw the ditch and were surprised. The enemies of Islam realized they would not be able to jump past the ditch with their animals because of its width, and they would not be able to climb down the ditch with their animals either. They would have to go down the ditch individually, putting themselves at risk of easily getting hit by the Muslims as they climbed down. The enemies of Islam camped outside the trenches in their tents to discuss their next move. Then the enemies decided to send someone to the Jewish tribe living inside Medina and ask them to join and help them attack the Muslims from inside. The Jewish tribe living inside initially refused at first because of their treaty with the Muslims. But after being tempted, they agreed to join the enemies and attack the Muslims from inside while the others attacked the Muslims from the outside. Once the Muslims heard the Jewish tribe from inside had betrayed the Muslims, the Muslims panicked and got terrified as they were about to be attacked from both the inside and outside of the city. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent all the women and kids to the house of one of the companions who was blind. Then God Almighty sent down strong winds, a sandstorm which has never hit the city of Medina like this before. The enemy's pots of food were blown and spoiled all over, and it became very difficult to see anything. The enemies had no other choice but to flee, which they did, and they were defeated without a war. The Muslims then eliminated the Jewish tribe of Banu Qurayza that betrayed the Muslims living inside the city of Medina. The Treaty of Hudabia the Prophet Muhammad had a dream in which he saw himself entering Makkah unopposed, doing tawaf, circling the Kaaba in Ihram, and shaving his hair. He interpreted this dream to mean he would be performing Umrah, lesser pilgrimage. So Prophet Muhammad and 1,400 of his companions went forth to perform Umrah in Mecca. As Prophet Muhammad and his companions were traveling to perform Umrah, as they drew near, they were warned that the idol worshippers of Quraysh had sworn to prevent Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims from entering Makkah. God the Almighty caused the Prophet's camel to camp at a plain called Hudabayah. After Prophet Muhammad and the idol worshippers sent people back and forth to talk on their behalf, they met in person. 
the Prophet Muhammad explained to the idol worshippers of Quraysh that they had only come to perform pilgrimage and had no intentions for fighting. After negotiating back and forth, the truce of Hudaybiyah was signed by both groups. The treaty between the Muslims and the idol worshippers of Quraysh in Mecca stated that there would be no fighting between the two parties for ten years. And if any other tribe in Arabia wishes to join the Muslims or idol worshippers of Quraysh, they may do so. No side is allowed to attack the other, including the tribes that join the treaty. Prophet Muhammad's companions did not like the terms of the treaty, as it seemed unfavorable to them, and they were disappointed. Yet the Prophet accepted, honored, and abided by the treaty. During the return journey from Hudabayah, God the Almighty revealed a chapter in the Holy Quran named al fath the victor. God revealed that this truce was indeed a great victory for the Muslims. With this new treaty, the religion of Islam was able to flourish in the Arabian Peninsula and spread rapidly. The Muslims went from having 1,400 men in this gathering to 10,000 men two years later to liberate Makkah. A lot of good happened in the two years after this treaty was signed. The Conquest of Makkah Over the next year or two, different surrounding tribes joined either the Muslim side or the side of the idol worshippers of Mecca. One of the tribes that joined the idol worshippers side was the tribe of Bakra, and one of the tribes that joined the Muslim side was the tribe of Banu Kuza. Both of these tribes did not like each other and had a history of fighting with each other. The tribe of Bakra from the idol worshippers side asked permission from the Mecca idol worshippers if they could attack and confiscate the belongings of the tribe of Kuza, even though they would go against the treaty. The idol worshippers of Mecca allowed it, and even provided them with some weapons to earn a share of the profits they were going to confiscate and advised them to go at night so they wouldn't be seen. After the attack, the news reached Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims. The idol worshippers got nervous and decided to send their leader, Abu Safyan, to talk to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and ask for the existing treaty to be renewed. However, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not assure him that the treaty was still valid because they had broken the treaty. After this event, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Muslims raised a big army of 10,000 men to surprise attack the idol worshippers in Mecca for what they did. When the Muslims reached Mecca, the people of Mecca were overwhelmed and unable to fight the Muslims. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not fight them and offered safety and security for anyone that did not fight. He announced to the people of Mecca that anyone who stays in the Kaaba or their homes or in the home of Abu Sufyan, their leader who ended up converting to Islam, would be safe. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, entered Mecca with his head bowed down in humility, his head touching the back of his camel. He also circulated the Kaaba. Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims, peace be upon them, conquered the city of Mecca in a bloodless battle. This was the end of many years of persecution. Then he ordered every idol in Kaaba to be destroyed, and he participated in destroying all 360 idols. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would point at an idol and it would fall to the ground. The Kaaba was purified of all idols. Prophet Muhammad then ordered Bilal, peace be upon him, who had a strong, melodious voice, to call the Adan, which became the first Adan in Islamic history from the Kaaba, proclaiming the worship of the one and only true God. The Farewell Hajj After Makkah had been conquered, Prophet Muhammad and many of his companions returned to Medina. It was the ninth year of Hijrah. Each tribe from all over the Arabian Peninsula sent a group of representatives to greet Prophet Muhammad, to declare their allegiance and pledge their commitment to him. Prophet Muhammad and his companions, peace be upon them, hosted the groups of representatives in the Prophet's mosque in Medina. The representatives of each tribe heard the Holy Quran being recited, watched the companions pray, and learned about Islam from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The representatives of the tribes returned to their people, calling them to accept Islam, teaching them what they'd learned, and telling them they needed to get rid of all their idols. 
Eventually, the whole Arabian Peninsula had accepted Islam. In the tenth year of Hijra, Allah the Glorious revealed a command to perform Hajj for those capable of doing so. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, announced that he was going to perform Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. Flocks of people, tens of thousands of people from all over joined him. It was the largest gathering in the Arabian Peninsula at the time. Throughout the Hajj pilgrimage, Prophet Muhammad gave several sermons, including the famous primary sermon, on the day of Arafat, from the plain of Arafat, Mount of Mercy. There he declared equality and solidarity between all Muslims and reminded them of all the duties Islam had enjoined them upon. He forbade racism, stealing, killing people, involvement in interest, and more. He commanded everyone to be good and just to their wives and women. He told them there are two things if they hold on to, they will not go astray, and that is the Book of Allah, the Holy Quran, and the Sunnah, the teachings of the last and final prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. He reminded them that they would return to their Lord one day who will judge them based on their deeds. In the end, he asked them, Have I not conveyed the message? The companions replied, Yes. Then Prophet Muhammad raised his hands in the air and looked up into the sky and said three times, O oh Allah, you bear witness. Prophet Muhammad returns to Medina and passes away. Soon after, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, returned to the city of Medina. Prophet Muhammad received his final revelation from God. Now that the faith of Islam was well established among his people and his community, his mission was coming to an end. Soon after that, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fell ill for ten to twelve days or so as his fever worsened in the house of his wife Aisha, peace be upon her, the mother of the believers. His body would get hot, and Aisha, peace be upon her, would recite the Quran over him and cool him off with a wet towel. He then sadly passes away on the lap of his wife, Aisha, peace be upon her. His companions were in shock and very sad about this tragedy. He was buried in the exact place he died, and his companions prayed for him individually. Today, millions of Muslims go to Medina and send their salutations of our blessed Prophet. In the Holy Quran, God states that he did not send Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, except as a mercy for humanity. His role as the leader of the Islamic State was taken over by Abu Bakr. Peace be upon him. The End